This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 46, for broadcast on the 13th of June, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, the possible discovery of a potential fourth type of neutrino, meaning the possibility of a long-awaited solution to dark matter. And NASA confirms the discovery of ancient organic material on Mars. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Well, it's not a fact yet, but dark matter, one of the biggest questions in astronomy and physics, may just have been solved. It's one of the possible ramifications of what could be the most important discovery in science since the accelerating expansion of the universe, finding the Higgs boson, and the detection of gravitational waves. So what are we talking about? Well, scientists may have just discovered a potential fourth type of neutrino, which could be the hypothetical sterile neutrino particle, considered by many as the particle responsible for dark matter. The findings have appeared in the pre-press physics website archive.org. What makes these results so significant is that two different teams of scientists using two independent methods have now observed the same effect. Now, let me again stress, this doesn't mean the sterile neutrino has been found, nor does it mean the mystery of dark matter is solved. But it is a damn exciting time right now for science. Dark matter is a mysterious substance which makes up about 80% of all the mass in the universe. Scientists know dark matter exists because they can see its gravitational interaction on the rotation of galaxies. Something other than the gravity available from all the visible matter in the galaxies are preventing them from flying apart as they revolve. This mysterious stuff appears to be invisible and only interacts gravitationally with normal matter. Scientists named it dark matter because no one knows what it is, and the race has been on for decades now to try and determine what it's made of. Hypothetical elemental particles called sterile neutrinos have long been considered one possible candidate. Other than photons, neutrinos are the most abundant particles in the universe. Neutrinos are extremely weakly interacting, almost massless elemental particles meaning they can't be broken down into anything smaller than themselves, other than perhaps vibrating strings of energy. In fact, neutrinos are so weakly interacting with all other particles that there are something like a hundred trillion of them passing through you every second, unimpeded and undetected. Neutrinos interact only through the weak nuclear force, and because they do have at least some mass, gravity. They're created by the beta radioactive decay of atomic nuclei or hadrons through nuclear reactions such as those that take place in the cores of stars, in supernova explosions, in the spin down of neutron stars, in nuclear reactors, atomic bombs, in particle accelerators, and when accelerated particles or cosmic rays collide with atoms. Neutrinos were thought to come in three discrete but barely measurable neutrino masses, and they were thought to oscillate between three different types or flavours, called the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino, each with its own corresponding antiparticle. Back in the mid-1990s, the Los Alamos National Laboratory's liquid scintillator neutrino detector in New Mexico found evidence suggesting the possible existence of a heavier fourth flavour of neutrino, a so-called sterile neutrino. But the results couldn't be replicated, and so the findings were set aside. Now, the new research by physicists with the Mini Burney experiment at the Fermilab National Accelerator Laboratory near Chicago have made similar observations, but using a different method. While Los Alamos fired beams of neutrinos through a water insulator to a detector, Fermilab used oil as its insulator. And so the new research by the physicists at Fermilab appears to have validated the earlier findings by Los Alamos. Now, key to both results is the existence of more electron flavor neutrinos than expected. Neutrinos normally oscillate between the three types, but this overpopulation of electron flavor neutrinos leads to the theory that some of the muon neutrinos became hidden heavier sterile neutrinos for a time during their regular oscillations. The sterile neutrinos could reasonably be assumed to have transitioned into heavier electron neutrinos in their next oscillation phase, thus explaining the higher electron numbers. The way the physicists describe it, the Fermilab experiment 
achieved a standard deviation of 4.8 sigma, not enough to make the 5 sigma threshold scientists look for. 5 sigma means there's only a 1 in 3.5 million chance of a specific result occurring. However, when the Fermilab and Los Alamos results are combined, it theoretically represents a 6.1 sigma finding. Pretty cool, but the problem is no other neutrino detectors have replicated these results or found anything similar using other methods, and that remains a serious problem. Still, if confirmed in future experiments, the discovery of the sterile neutrino would provide significant challenges for the standard model of particle physics, the very foundations of science's understanding of the universe. Los Alamos National Laboratory Director Terry Wallace has described the Fermilab results as a fascinating step forward for particle physics, although one that does need to be tempered by the simple fact that future observations are still required to really clinch this beyond any shadow of a doubt. The Los Alamos co-lead on the project, Richard Vanderwater, says while scientists can't definitely say it's a sterile neutrino, they can conclusively say that something very fundamental is going on. It could be a sterile neutrino, but it could just as easily be something else. The important thing remains that the same effect has now been observed in two separate experiments with a very small chance that there's a mistake in both experiments. The bottom line is, researchers are still seeing what shouldn't be there. That's important. Van der Water says he likes to think that this could be the first hint of the dark sector of physics, perhaps interacting through neutrinos and providing a way to probe things like dark energy and dark matter. Meanwhile, Joe Lycan, the Deputy Director of Research at Fermilab, says the findings do represent exciting times for neutrino research. The latest results provide even stronger motivation for the three short baseline neutrino experiments at Fermilab, which are based on liquid argon technology. The Mini Burney detector was established through a collaborative effort at Fermilab in 2002 to search for unusual neutrino interactions. In recent years, the detectors collected data to study background interactions related to the short baseline neutrino program. About 50 scientists from some 20 institutions worldwide are continuing to work on the analysis of data recorded by the experiment. Neutrino research has been an ongoing effort at Los Alamos since the 1950s research by Frederick Rains and George Cowan. That work won the 1995 Nobel Prize in Physics for the detection of neutrinos experimentally after the particles had been theorized by Wolfgang Pauli in 1930. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's Curiosity rover has discovered organic molecules in three billion year old sedimentary rocks just below the Martian surface. While not evidence of life itself, the new findings provide circumstantial evidence supporting the hypothesis that the red planet could have supported life. Organic molecules are ones containing carbon and hydrogen, may also contain oxygen, nitrogen and other elements. The lead author of one of the two studies reported in the journal Science, Jen Eigenbrode from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says Curiosity has not determined the exact source of these organic molecules. While commonly associated with life, organic molecules can also be created through non-biological processes and so are not necessarily indicators of life. Of course, today the surface of Mars is an inhospitable freeze-dried desert. But there's clear evidence that the red planet was once a warm, wet world, with liquid water streams and rivers flowing into lakes and oceans, providing a climate and environment that would have been capable of hosting life as we know it. The data from Curiosity reveals that billions of years ago, a liquid water lake inside the rover's gale crater landing site held all the ingredients necessary for life, including the right chemical building blocks and energy sources. The Martian surface today is exposed to radiation from space, and both that radiation and harsh chemicals can break down organic matter. The ancient organic molecules were discovered in powdered drill samples collected from the top 5 centimetres of rock that were deposited when Mars may have been a far more habitable world. To identify the organic material in the Martian soil, Curiosity drilled into sedimentary rocks known as mudstone from four areas in Gale Crater. The mudstone gradually formed billions of years ago from silt that accumulated at the bottom of the ancient lake. The rock samples were analysed using the rover's science laboratory oven, which heated the samples to over 500 degrees Celsius, enough to release the organic molecules from the powdered rock. Curiosity spectrograph then measured small organic molecules that came off the mudstone sample, fragments of larger organic molecules that don't vaporise easily. Some of these fragments were found to contain sulphur, which could have helped preserve them in the same way sulphur is used to make car tyres more durable. 
The results also indicate organic carbon concentrations in the order of 10 parts per million or more. This is close to the amounts observed in Martian meteorites, and about 100 times greater than the prior detections of organic carbon on the Martian surface. Some of the molecules identified include thiophenes, benzene, tulanine and small carbon chains such as propane and butene. Back in 2013, Curiosity detected some organic molecules containing chlorine in rocks at the very deepest point in Gale Crater. This new discovery, therefore, builds on an inventory of molecules already detected in the ancient lake sediments on Mars and helps explain why they were preserved. In the second study reported in Science, researchers analysed atmospheric samples collected by Curiosity, showing seasonal variations in methane in the Martian atmosphere over the course of nearly three Martian years, equivalent to almost six Earth years. The same sort of seasonal methane emissions were first detected by Earth-based telescopes and the European Space Agency's Mars Express Orbiter. Geological interactions between water and rock may well have generated the methane, but here on Earth the most common source of methane is biological. What the new results do show is that low levels of methane within Gale Crater repeatedly peak in warm summer months and drop off again in winter every year. The study's lead author, Chris Webster, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the new observations were made possible because of Curiosity's longevity, allowing scientists to observe seasonal patterns. NASA's Science Mission Director and Associate Administrator Thomas Zerbichin says the new findings of methane in the atmosphere and ancient carbon preserved on the surface of Mars means Mars is telling scientists to stay the course and keep searching for evidence of life on the red planet. And of course, it's also telling scientists where to send future missions and what to look out for. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. SpaceX has successfully launched NASA's latest twin grey satellites to study the ongoing environmental changes as the impacts of global warming continue to worsen. The twin spacecraft of the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment Follow-On or GRACE FO mission is a joint project by the American Space Agency and the German Research Center for Geosciences. The mission blasted off from Space Launch Complex 4E at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California aboard a Falcon 9 rocket, sharing the ride to orbit with five Iridium Next telecommunication satellites. Flight tanks configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7... Six, five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff of GRACE follow-on, continuing the legacy of the GRACE mission of tracking the movement of water across our planet. Eagles pitching downrange. Stage one props nominal. GC copies, we'll go. Power and telemetry nominal. Falcon 9 performing nominally. We're currently throttling down the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage, preparing for the period of maximum dynamic pressure and going supersonic. Falcon 9 is supersonic. You heard the call out, Falcon 9 is supersonic. We're throttling the Merlin 1D engines back up as we pass through the period of maximum Beautiful dynamic pressure. Maximum dynamic pressure. Trajectory looks good for Falcon 9. Falcon 9 continues to track downrange well. Power on the Merlin 1D engines looks good. Avionics power looks good. And back engine chill has begun. The MVAC engine chill call out indicates that we have opened the pre-valve. We're beginning to chill in the upper stage engine in preparation for ignition. Now the sequence of events coming up at T plus 245, we will have main engine cutoff, we'll shut down the nine Merlin engines. The first stage will then separate and we will light the second stage engine. We're throttling down the engines in preparation for MECO. MECO, MVAC ignition. Stage 1 AFTS. We've had eight. successful shutdown and separation. Second stage engine has lit. Separation of the payload fairing. Draft <laughs> fairing separation confirmed. The trajectory is nominal. The power on the upper stage engine is good. Right, right, separation fairing separation confirmed. successfully. Stage 2 is following a nominal trajectory. Everything's going nominal. After their deployment, ground stations acquired signals from both Grace FO spacecraft. And initial telemetry shows the satellites are performing as expected. The Grace FO satellites are spending their first few weeks in space, moving to the separation distance needed to perform their mission. Once they reach this distance of 220 kilometres, the mission will begin an 85-day in-orbit checkout phase. Grace mission managers in Darmstadt, Germany, will evaluate the instruments and satellite systems and perform calibration and alignment procedures. Then the satellites will begin gathering and processing scientific data. 
The first science data package is expected to be released in about seven months' time. Over its five-year mission, GRACIFO will monitor the movement of mass around the planet, measuring where and how that mass movement changes Earth's gravitational pull. You see, the more mass there is, the more gravity that generates. Grace FO continues the work and the US-German partnership of the original Grace mission, which operated from 2002 to 2017. For 15 years, Grace's monthly maps of regional gravity variations has provided new insights into how the Earth's system is functioning and responding to changes in climate brought about by global warming. GRACE was the first mission to measure the amount of ice being lost from the Greenland and Antarctic ice caps. The mission improved science's understanding of the processes involved for sea level rise and ocean circulation. It provided fresh insights into where global groundwater resources are shrinking or growing, it showed where dry soils are contributing to drought, and monitored physical changes in the solid earth such as those caused by earthquakes. The Australian National University developed the software to analyse the data from the Grace FO mission to estimate the melting polar ice sheets, increases in ocean mass and hydrological cycles across Australia and the rest of the planet. Knowing how fast the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica are melting is crucial for assessing the impacts of climate change. As well as the global picture, closer to home, the twin probes will also make precision measurements of how groundwater is changing in the Murray-Darling Basin from one month to the next. Grace FO project scientist Frank Webb from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says that to understand changes taking place in the climate system, scientists need data records several decades long. Extending the data record from Grace through Grace FO will allow scientists to better distinguish short-term variability from longer-term trends. The Grace FO satellites are flying at an altitude of about 490 kilometres, travelling at about 7.5 kilometres per second in the near polar orbit, circling the Earth every 90 minutes. The probes are flying at a set distance exactly 220 kilometres apart, using advanced lasers to continually measure their separation to within the width of a human red blood cell. Changes in the Earth's gravitational field, caused by variations in the planet's mass density directly beneath the spacecraft as they orbit, cause slight changes in the distance between the two spacecraft, as first one and then the other is affected by these gravitational changes. Scientists from the Australian National University also helped design the new laser measurement instruments used on GRACE FO. The ANU's Professor Daniel Shaddock says GRACE FO is the first mission to use lasers between spacecraft to determine their exact separation distance. He says the new lasers provide an improvement in measurement by a factor of 20. The original GRACE mission used a microwave ranging instrument to perform the, the primary gravity measurement, which is basically how far apart are the satellites and how do they wobble relative to each other as they pass over the Earth's surface. And that's pretty accurate. That's accurate down to about 10 microns or so in terms of measuring changes of the separation of the spacecraft. We really want to do better than that. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that's happened with laser uh, metrology, laser distance measuring in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. So that was something that JPL took the opportunity to put on board with uh, launching this follow-on mission, GRACE follow-on, to hopefully improve the measurement that we're making in the Earth's gravity. And it looks like you've improved those measurements by a factor of 20. Yeah, that's right. So that's the goal, is sort of to do 20, but I think we can probably do even a little bit better than that. And the reason that we can do better than that is because there's been literally decades of investment in laser metrology for a completely different purpose, and that's for measuring gravitational waves. In fact, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded just a few months ago for the detection of gravitational waves by the LIGO project. And there's been plans for a long time to put the same technology up into space to measure gravitational waves from distant black holes colliding and other interesting sources in the universe. Yeah, there's been a test with that called LISA Pathfinder, which seems to have gone reasonably well. Yeah, that's right. So LISA Pathfinder was the test mission that would test some of the laser technology that would be used for LISA, the main mission, which is hopefully going to launch in around 10 to 15 years. LISA Pathfinder tested all of the interferometry within a spacecraft, and LISA will basically perform a measurement of the distance between spacecraft, very similar to Grace follow-on. For LISA, it has to measure changes in separation of spacecraft that are 5 million kilometres apart, down to around 10 picometres, so a millionth of a millionth of a metre. And so when Grace came along and said, hey, we, we'd like to measure the change in separation between spacecraft that are 200 kilometres apart, and we only need 20 nanometres, that seemed like a piece of cake at the <laughs> time. Um, 
I mean, really, it's a very challenging measurement, but it's because of the investment, all the expertise that have been built up for gravitational wave detection that we can take that technology. And in fact, most of the people who developed that technology came and worked on the GRACE follow-on mission, either at JPL or in Germany or in Australia. How does that help? You're trying to determine differences in, in mass and gravity of different parts of the planet. So basically the way that it works is, you, imagine you just had one spacecraft uh, up in orbit around the Earth, and it's in a polar orbit, so it's going around from North Pole and South Pole and back again. And then you can think of the Earth as sort of slowly rotating underneath it. So every 90 minutes, the spacecraft go around and they come back over a different area of the Earth. Now, if there's an, an area with higher mass concentration, then the spacecraft actually speeds up very slightly until it passes the mass and it starts to be pulled back and slows down a little bit. And the first geodesy missions actually just put one spacecraft up. One of them looked like a, a golf ball with a whole bunch of retroflectors on it. And they used to hit it with laser beams from the ground to figure out exactly where it was. The problem with hitting it from the ground is that as laser beams go through the atmosphere, there's a whole range of effects which corrupt that measurement, which means you can only get sort of millimetre accuracy of where that spacecraft is. By putting up a second spacecraft that's a 220 kilometres behind it, we can now make this differential measurement with no atmosphere in between. So even though the gravity signal is somewhat common to both of those spacecraft, our ability to make the measurement improves so drastically that the measurement turns out to give us much more information about gravity. Because there's different types of material that the spacecraft are flying over, those different types of materials have different densities, consequently different masses, and that means different gravity. Exactly. So if you look at one of the geoids that comes out of the GRACE measurement data, so the geoid is basically a map of the gravitational potential of the Earth. If the Earth was a perfect sphere, the geoid would be very, very boring. It would be a sphere itself. But because we have mountains and valleys and water and rock that all have different densities and therefore different gravity signals, it turns out to be quite a lumpy thing. Now, the GRACE measurement uh, is very, very good at measuring mountains and valleys and these sort of static effects. But the thing that it's really, really good at is measuring changes in that gravity signal from one month to the next. And as you can imagine, not really much changes on the Earth from one month to the next. Mountains don't move. The ocean's still basically where it was. And so the only thing that really moves from one month to the next you know, on a large-scale mass transport is water. And so GRACE is really a, a hydrology mission that tells us about how water moves around the surface of the Earth. And this is really useful for producing maps of the melting of polar ice in Antarctica or in Greenland. One of the things that Australia is are particularly interested in is it can measure groundwater. It can measure water below the surface of the Earth without having to go out and make an in-situ measurement or drill wells or anything like that, which for a sparsely populated country like Australia, that's also one of the driest continents, turns out to be very, very useful, knowing how much we can irrigate where water is being lost from our system. So that's good for both the Murray-Darling Basin and also the Great Artesian Basin as well, I guess. Exactly, exactly. And so the, the level of changes in water that GRACE can detect, it can detect very, very small changes in the height of the water table, but one of the challenges is to get better spatial resolution. So GRACE has a part passes over an area can basically tell if there's been a gain or loss of water by only a few millimetres if it was 600 metres in diameter. So imagine a hockey puck of water a few millimetres high but 600 kilometres wide. If that disappeared, Grace could see it. So that's one of the challenges going forward with these types of missions is how do we get better and better spatial resolution on the surface of the Earth so that we, instead of seeing just Murray-Darling Basin, we can originally, eventually go down to, to much smaller areas which will be really very useful for water accounting. So that's one of the challenges that these geodesy missions have going forward. Climate change, global warming, that's changing the uh, water balance around the entire planet, isn't it? Exactly. And, and water turns out to be one of the very early indicators of climate change. So it's a very, a very important litmus test to, to, uh, to get this data and analyse this data. One of the reasons that GRACE follow-on was, was so important was because GRACE had been so successful that we wanted continuity of, of data to the largest extent possible. Now, unfortunately, even though the original GRACE mission lasted far longer than its five-year lifetime, uh, it ended up lasting more like 15 years. We didn't quite get the overlap with GRACE follow-on. However, by combining these data sets with different measurements taken on the ground and also by building an exact copy of GRACE for the, the primary microwave measurement, we hope that we can line these data sets up fairly well. That's Professor Daniel Shaddock from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that the removal of tonsils and adenoids during childhood has been associated with a significant increased risk of long-term respiratory, allergic and infectious diseases. 
It's the first time researchers have examined the long-term effects of these fairly common childhood operations. You can read about the findings in the Journal of the American Medical Association. A new study says the number of cancer cases globally has increased by a third between 2006 and 2016, largely because of an ageing and growing global population. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association Oncology, showed that there were 17.2 million cancer cases and 8.9 million cancer deaths in 2016. In Australia, that cancer rate increased slightly, but the death rate dropped slightly. Skin, prostate, colon and rectal cancers were the most common in 2016, while lung, colon, rectal and prostate cancers were the deadliest. Since the Montreal Protocol was brought in, atmospheric levels of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, have been steadily decreasing. However, new research warns that the decline of one of these compounds, CFC11, trichlorofluoromethane, seems to have stalled with the decline slowing by about 50% since 2012. A report in the journal Nature warns that CFC11 appears to have actually increased since 2012, suggesting that this may be due to new unreported production of the compound, which would be inconsistent with the agreed phasing out of CFC production by 2010 under the Montreal Protocol. The hunt is now on to find out who's illegally producing it. The Montreal Protocols and their ban on CFCs were brought in to combat the effects of chlorofluorocarbons on the Earth's ozone layer, a protective blanket of molecules in the Earth's atmosphere which helps shield the planet from ultraviolet radiation. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, has released its annual Targeting Scams report as part of Scams Awareness Week. The report reveals that Australians lost $340 million to scammers in 2017. That's a $40 million increase over the previous year and the largest reported loss since the ACCC began reporting on scam activity. Investment scams topped the losses, followed closely by dating and romance scams. The ACCC warns that some scams are becoming quite sophisticated and hard to spot, with scammers using modern technology like social media to contact and deceive their victims. Some of the most common scams these days are pretending to be from government agencies or well-known service providers, threatening people with fines, prison time or the loss of benefits if they don't do what the scammers are asking. Driver's licences in the Australian state of New South Wales are going digital. As well as the usual plastic photo ID licence, there'll now be a digital version located on an app downloaded to your smartphone. State digital fishing and boating licences were introduced back in 2015 and South Australia began rolling out digital driver's licences last September. With all the details, we're joined by Alex Sahara of Reut from IT Wire. Well, what's happening is that there's an app called the Service New South Wales app, and this is the app that you interact in government with to get various licenses and pay for various government services. And they'd like to have a digital license that's showing your photograph, the class of license that you have, the name of the license, there's a QR code, the license number expiry date, date of birth, the same sort of information that you have actually on your license now, but it's appearing on the screen of your phone so that you can then show that to whether it's a police officer or for identification purposes. And uh, there would clearly have to be some sort of interactive ability for somebody to be able to check that that's actually a license and not just a a photographic screenshot, which could be edited by Photoshop to to denote that somebody is uh, of a different age. There would probably be some biometrics associated with that as well. There would have to be, and I'm looking actually at a screenshot of this particular driver's license at the moment, and there are those sort of holographic style lines over the face of the person and in the background. So that would specifically make it harder to be able to Photoshop that. But there's been a trial in place from October 2017 to February this year. That was a trial in the New South Wales country city of Dubbo. Yes, that and place really does exist. I've looked it up on a map. It's <laughs> yeah. called Dubbo. And, and it, there are elephants there, but only in a zoo. Right. Yes. Well, that's Dumbo. <laughs> anyway, this test was to check out the convenience and functionality of the digital driver's license. And as it is planned on being rolled out by 2019, it looks as though that trial was successful. If you have the choice to opt in, you'll still get a plastic license card. They say it'll be convenient, be able to update your details and re- renew your license from your mobile device. You'll have security, it says control your personal information and real-time information. Now, in the Australian Capital Territory, which is within New South Wales, it's the, the capital of Australia, Canberra, like I the had the license. of Columbia there. for our American yeah, that, listeners. I renewed my license online. It had actually expired and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, it's a, it's a weekend, I'm going to have to go in on the Monday, I would have to delay my trip because... I forgot. Then I remembered, oh, I can just register online. So I went online to their website, even though it was a weekend. It let me renew it. And it said, look, we've got your photo. It's, look, we only got that photo last year. You can use this photo for up to five years if you want. If you're happy with that, just click the button here, pay the money, 
you can then print out this uh, sheet of paper that, that denotes you've got a license, and within the next four weeks, you'll receive one in the mail. So you, I kind of sort of had a digital license, as it were. I had to print it out on paper rather than show it on a on the okay. screen of my phone. But um, you know, this all the all the back end for this sort of thing is already in place. It just requires there to be a digital license inside of an app that is secure. The concern for some people is that they don't wish to hand their mobile phone over to police, who could then be theoretically going through the various apps on your phone or checking various things uh, because they just you know they don't <laughs> see, necessarily want to do see that. See the photos so, that you took last night. Yeah, may also be a way of, Wiener, if he's listening. That's right. But there may also be a way to have that particular digital license appear on your home screen or your lock screen or have it so that it is locked so that the person who gets your phone, whichever government authority they're from, or even just the bouncer, you know, checking your ID, isn't able to then go from that screen back into the rest of your phone. Alex Sahara of Roy from ITY reporting. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.